Congratulate the Los Angeles Dodgers for a great victory last evening. Yes, wonderful victory. We are still waiting, members, for the quorum. We are going to begin with our presentations, and our first presentation is by the Honorable Herb Wesson. Mr. Wesson. Uh, okay, uh, we got to get the real president to sit down. He's disrupting my six minutes of fame. Well, they were applauding I, him for his presence in the council chambers. Well, we're, we're glad to have them here today. I'm going to ask Mr. Koretz to join me because he's an animal lover. Today is my favorite Friday. It's Pet Adoption Friday. We've had, we have two uh, phenomenal uh, dogs here. If I, you could give me one, and I'll take Radar. And Paul, if you would take get pickles, uh, radar and pickles. Radar and Paul has uh, pickles. Pickles. Okay. No. Well, now you know you have pickles. Anyway, in the city of Los Angeles, uh, we started the Pet Adoption Friday because we realized how important it is for us to find uh, companion animals for people and to find people for companion animals. We do this because we, we want you to save the lives of these two dogs. Uh, Radar, I believe, or Pickles, has been in the shelter since May. Pickles. Mm -hmm. 
pickles. And how long have we had radar? Since August. And we've had radar since August. We will not be able to keep them forever. So we are asking someone here in the chambers today or one of the city employees, and I want to thank the city employees because over two-thirds of the animals that Mr. Koretz and I present before uh, you have been adopted by city employees. So we're asking you today to save two lives. Pickles, I think, is about five or six. Radar is six or seven. They've got a lot of energy, and if you want unconditional love, trust me, you will find it in these two gentlemen. Unfortunately, the first part of Radar's life, uh, he was abused. But as you can see, he's just as friendly and as feisty as he can be. And Pickles, Pickles, is, Pickles is, is horned in on his territory. But we're looking for a home. Hey, man, you're not helping yourself, okay? I'm doing the best I can to market you. I'm your agent here. So anyway... It, like I said, twice a month I uh, have uh, I bring dogs before the council. Mr. Koretz brings cats. And because I have two of them today, I asked him for his assistance. So we're asking for someone to please come save a life. They've gotten their shots, they're microchipped, and they're ready to go. And with that, Mr. Koretz, I'm going to ask you to say a few words. I know you generally do cats, but wing it hey well, I'm a cat person and a dog person although I have two cats at home that are both rescues uh, we have a lot of great animals in the shelters not all of them get adopted um, that's kind of a tragedy so what we need to do is get the word out adopt these two wonderful dogs but also get the word out that we have wonderful dogs and cats in the shelters we have six shelters uh, brimming with very adoptable animals um, so Come out and adopt these two wonderful dogs, but uh, if not, uh, come out to the shelters and, and uh, look for other terrific animals. We have a lot of great opportunities and a lot of uh, lives of wonderful pets to be saved. And thank you. And uh, please call, if you're interested, 888-452-7381 for pickles or radar and if you call and they've already been adop adopted like Mr. Koretz says we have hundreds of, uh, of adopted uh, animals in, in search of a home so please today you have an opportunity to save uh, two lives I would adopt them myself but I'd have to go live with Mr. Joe Sorrell because my wife would kick me out because I already have three in fact uh, we may honor Mr. Sorrell by giving him both of these dogs today anyway thank you Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weston. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. And thank you, Radar and Pickles. Our adoption program continues. Our next presentation by the Honorable Eric Garcetti. And, and, and Mr. Council Tom Member Tom LaBonge. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. A great pleasure uh, today to join with Mr. LaBonge, who I will toss it over to in, in just a second. Um, to celebrate Italian American Heritage Month in the city of Los Angeles and throughout the United States of America. Um, with our friends that are here today, I asked a simple question just because we always talk about the contributions of, of great Italian Americans. Um, and I asked them, who was it that hit the game winning hit yesterday for the Dodgers in the ninth inning? And of course, Loretta, it was an Italian American who took us all the way home yesterday. And if we ever doubted in these tough times that anything is possible, the Dodgers certainly showed us last night that even in the, the darkest hours, it is absolutely attainable. Uh, today, we celebrate Italian American Heritage Month. Um, the story of my own family uh, is linked back to Italy when a great great grandfather uh, came to Mexico, to the Americas. And throughout the Americas, Italians came to not only the United States, but Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, all over. And um, through uh, the state of uh, Parral, or Chihuahua, the, the town of Parral, uh, eventually his children came north um, here to Los Angeles. But here in America, uh, Italian Americans are the fifth largest ethnic group. And here in Los Angeles, we are an Italian city. We're actually the fourth biggest city of people of Italian descent, uh, the fifth largest metropolitan area. It's estimated that we have about 
um, it, total here in the metropolitan area, 568,000 people who trace their heritage back to Italy. Um, and as a metropolitan area, that's impressive. You know, San Francisco always gets a reputation as being the Italian town in uh, California, but we know that our friends to the north have only a small fraction of that, about 40,000 Italian Americans who live up there. And Los Angeles really is um, a little Italy right here. So many folks joined with us just a couple weeks ago to celebrate San Gennaro Festival, which each year is a traditional celebration for us of a food and culture, of music, um, and the contributions that have been made uh, by Italians. Without Italians and Italian Americans, we wouldn't have pianos, violins, calendars, radios, telescopes, compasses, microscopes, thermometers, eyeglasses, the steam engine, typewriters and batteries, uh, Joe Sorrell, pasta, <laughs> who's our greatest Italian American. We wouldn't be called America without an Italian, uh, Americo Vespucci and Christopher Columbus and uh, Giovanni de Veranzano, the explorers who came here um, from the old world to the new. Um, from Europe to the Americas to uh, make the settlements that were part of the founding of, of all the nations of the Americas. Um, when we look at this specific country, the first, though, was Veranzano, who set foot in 1524 on land which was, it is now Rhode Island. Uh, but Italian Americans in great waves of immigration, um, especially around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, were not just the great minds, but the great muscle behind the growth of this country. Um, Italian Americans have toiled and labored while helping to build our nation's infrastructure, railroads, tunnels, highways, and subways. They've contributed to sports, as I mentioned before. Um, we not only have, of course, Mr. Loretta, but Joe DiMaggio, uh, singers like Frank Sinatra, uh, Henry Mancini, and also Oscar-winning uh, actor um, Robert De Niro. And here in Los Angeles, and Mr. Wiesar, who represents um, a good portion of what was once uh, Little Italy, as does Mr. Reyes, um, Ms. Hahn, who has gone to Ischia, where there's a strong connection between Ischians and um, San Pedro. Uh, we all know that the connections throughout our districts to Italy and to Italian Americans are incredibly strong. And this is a council that sounds very proudly um, recognizing Los Angeles as an Italian-American city. So as we celebrate Italian Heritage Month, we uh, call on Mr. L.A. himself, a man who uh, must have some Italian in him, uh, Mr. Labonghi, uh, to say a few things uh, and to introduce some of our special guests uh, to celebrate Italian Heritage Month festivities today in the city of Los Angeles. Tom Labon. All right, give a big hand for Eric Garcetti. And I ask you all to make way. Well, I'm not going to speak. I'm going to ask Patty Palumbo to sing for us this morning. Je 
Fatima, si je te mets procure à toi, si tu ne m'aimes pas, si tu ne m'aimes pas, je t'aime. Mais si je t'aime, si je t'aime, procure à toi. Bravo. Give Patty a big hand right here. Wonderful singing right there. What a wonderful way to start this here. And uh, we're joined by the great councilman of the 14th district, the birthplace of Los Angeles, and Italian Hall councilman Jose Wezar. Big hand for Jose. Well, good morning, and it's a great pleasure to be here with so many Italians that we celebrate Italian Heritage Month in the city of Los Angeles. And here in the birthplace of the city, as Mr. Tom LeBange would know, we had an Italian-American museum, a heritage place where people celebrated their heritage. It was called the Italian Hall. And at one time in the history of this great El Pueblo, of this great Alvera Street, the Italians managed about one-third of Alvera Street, the birthplace of the city of Los Angeles. But as you all know, the Italian-American community grew, and they moved on to many parts of Los Angeles and Southern California. And uh, now, thankfully, after many, many years, the Italian-American community has gone back to El Pueblo. In 1990, has gone back to mobilize and preserve the Italian Hall. And just a couple of years ago, the council approved a $3 million commitment to renovate and rehabilitate our beautiful Italian hall. That's good news. Great news. Next summer, we will focus on preserving the Sequeiros mural that's on top of the Italian hall. And soon thereafter, we will begin the, re the uh, reparations uh, on uh, the uh, Italian hall. And once complete, the historic Italian Hall Foundation will have a museum to highlight the important role that Italian Americans have played in Los Angeles and the historic role that the Italian Hall has played in our multi-ethnic city. And what I love about this city is that we celebrate our diversity and we celebrate it together. We celebrate honoring the contributions that all our communities have made to this great city. And I'm happy to be here because when I go visit the Italian Americans, they make me feel at home. It's about family, it's about good food, and they make me feel like a paisano. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Mr. Reyes, who has the wonderful part of old, old, old Little Italy. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Eric. It's an honor to be here. You know, growing up in Lincoln Heights, many of my friends in elementary school, Sacred Heart of Jesus, came from Italian families. We'd go to the San Antonio winery, get some great uh, lunch. Uh, many of us worked at the San Antonio winery. We'd go to St. Peter's Church at Cathedral, right at the corner I went to high school. So all around me we had Italian-Americans, part of the community. It was a fading portion of the community because they kept moving out into other neighborhoods. But the core of the Italian history, its establishment, its focus in Los Angeles begins in the original suburbs of Los Angeles. So I want to thank them for their contribution, all the great work. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Marco Lamandri, who has been a leader in developing the business investment districts, another Italian-American. So when we look at this great contribution, and we look at organizers of community gardens, uh, these are the folks that make the incremental improvements that make the city a great city. So thank you and want to welcome the consulate to Los Angeles. Look forward to working with you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. The great councilwoman of the 15th District and all the ships at sea, including our very special sister city of Ischia. Yeah. All right, Janice Hart. Thank you. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. It's so great that we're celebrating Italian American Heritage Month, and I want to bring Carmela Funicello up yeah. here. Our chairperson. Our chairperson of the Sister City Organization for Ischia, Italy. Uh, Carmela came to me many years ago and says, we don't have a sister city uh, for Italy, and we in San Pedro have 30,000 Ischitani. 
uh, living there. They came to San Pedro many, many, many years ago and began uh, the great fishing industry uh, that is, has created so many jobs and so much of our identity in San Pedro. Uh, I traveled to Ischia several times with Carmela, and we formed the most beautiful sister city relationship uh, that I think we've ever had. And this chambers, the day that we celebrated, was packed with beautiful Italian Americans who have made such a difference, not only in San Pedro, but really throughout this entire region. So it's a great joy for me uh, to celebrate Italian American Heritage Month and to thank you, Carmela, for uh, bringing such a joy to my life of introducing me uh, to some of the most beautiful Italian Americans uh, that I will ever hope to meet. And we also have Via Italia uh, in San Pedro, uh, designating the street in front of the Italian American Club in San Pedro. So thank you for bringing such a great part of the Italian American heritage. Uh, to our beautiful town of San Pedro. Thank you, Carmela. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Jensen. Uh, it's uh, thanks to you, to Tom, and to all the thousands of people in San Pedro, Italian from Ischia and not from Ischia, uh, that um, gave us the inspiration to celebrate them, their sacrifice, their love for this country, their success in this country. Um, it was really a glorious day for us. Um, I'm so happy to be here to represent them, and I'm so happy to have a council woman like you oh, that everybody loves. Grazie. So Grazie. thank you. Okay. Okay. I, I just wanted to say, what a wonderful morning. There's a few more remarks that are going to be made. We loved our great opera singer, which yeah. is so great. But also we have a great author. And Mariana uh, Gatto, just for a second, come up here. She put this great book together. It's part of the history series right here of Italy and everything. And some of you know, know me a long time, the greatest Italian-American I had a love relationship with was the late, great John Farrar, whose chambers is named after uh, which is so special. And there's a feature on John in there, which is so, so important. And the other thing, too, I just wanted to say a shout out to, I know I uh, mentioned, the greatest, I think, uh, representative of athletics in Los Angeles is Tommy Lasorda. Whether it's the Olympics, whether it's the absolute Dodgers, whether it's any sport, Tom, Tommy is the greatest guy in the world. But our city, and we thank you so much for what you do and all this committee and the revitalization uh, has also over a hundred consulates here and representing the Italian government here is the Council General for Italy. Please welcome our very own Council General Nicolai Bonanello. Buongiorno. Tommy Labongo. <laughs> Buongiorno. Uh, oh, thank you very much and thank you to, for organizing this great ceremony. I'm very, no, let me express my thank really and commend the City of Los Angeles, the Council, the Council members and uh, the President Gazzetti for uh, uh, once again recognizing uh, October as the Italian Heritage Month uh, in Los Angeles. As I said, I'm very glad to be here representing the Italian government because uh, I think this, uh, this is a very significant event uh, for both two reasons. So not only recognize the great contributions the Italian Americans have given to the city of Los Angeles in the past, in the present, and will give, I'm sure, still in the future, and, but also because it's a, a good uh, in, for a stimulus mm -hmm. to do more and yeah. to work together to improve and to the preservation of the Italian heritage, as we mentioned before about the Italian Hall Foundation and the museum, which work, work together now with Mariana Gatto, with the foundation. So we are really, the Italian government really supports this effort to preserve the Italian heritage in Los Angeles. And also, uh, just remember another important element, of course, the Sister City Association, which was mentioned before. We were also doing a great job with Ischia and, and San Pedro, thanks to Council Roman, and Janice Anna, and Camilla Funicello and the association. And then another important symbol of the Italian culture and Italian social heritage in Los Angeles, which is the Watts Towers, mm -hmm. which we are also supporting, you know, and trying to preserve it and to make it more visible and more known also internationally and nationally to the, for the people uh, who live in Los Angeles or come, or come okay. to Los Angeles. And of course, we're working also on the, on the cultural side. And as you say, uh, we already started this uh, Heritage Month with a lot of cultural events with the San Gennaro Fest uh, uh, in Hollywood. And we'll end at the end of October with a great concert of uh, Morricone at the Hollywood yeah. Bowl, which is also yeah. a, big, uh, a big event, and a lot of other important events during, during the month. And uh, we're also trying 
to give more Italian uh, economic presence here. And as you all know, recently the, the decision of the Metropolitan Transit Authority to award the Italian company Ansaldo Breda the contract to build here, uh, also the possibility to build here a factory to, in this difficult economic moment to bring some jobs to Los Angeles and to work for the railroad system, which is very much needed also here in Los Angeles. So once again, thank you very much for organizing this event, which is very important to keep Italian heritage come together, and Italian institutions are very, very willing to work with you. And just to conclude, let me bring you the warm greeting of the new Italian ambassador in Washington, who just started his duty on the 1st of October, and really called me in to ask to bring this occasion his thanks and congratulations for this declaration and his confirmation of his support for what we are doing here as a president of the Italian government in the United States. Grazie ancora, and thank you very much. Mr. Wiesard, Mr. Garcetti, uh, it's time that we formally present the resolution signed by our Mayor Antonio Viragosa and everyone here, Italian Heritage Month for 2009. Yay! Keep clapping. <laughs> <laughs> One last thing. One last thing. There's a project. I know uh, Mr. Garcetti's working with Jimmy Kimball on that. Mr. Reyes is looking into his district. But there's a little project that we're working on right here. I hope you know and you're going to like it. But we hope to fund it and find a home for this sign. Yeah. San Pedro. All right. Good night. Good job. Good job. Thank you. 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 Uh, on your desks in front of you uh, is a little present from the Historic Italian Hall Foundation, the support group behind the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles. A uh, little basket of goodies from CD14's uh, Eagle Rock Italian Bakery. We hope you enjoy. Thank you. Another round of applause to Marianne Gatto for organizing today's event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Wiesar, Mr. Wiesar, you are next up for a presentation. Okay, I'll stay here, sir. All right. Our next presentation will be by yeah, Councilmember Jose Wiesar. And if any, anyone would like some great Italian food, there's some food in the back in room 333. Huh? Sorry, I gotta stay here. Mr. Wizard, we are we are ready for you. Okay, we're gonna have these folks pass by, and uh, then we'll start. Here we go. Come right through here. We'll get you done. Good to see you. It's okay, Tom. <laughs> Come meet. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary. Here we go. I'll get you. Here we go, much, Mr. President, and speaking of the diversity that we have in this great city, we're moving on from great Italian-American heritage to some of the Mexican heritage that we have here in the city of Los Angeles. And today, I am honored to be standing here next to uh, Jorge Rodriguez, 
the brother of the founder, uh, Don Jose, along with a family who started uh, uh, La Serenata de Garibaldi in Ball Heights, and we're here today to celebrate its 25th anniversary. <laughs> Big round of applause. Thank you, Tom. And we're also here with Aurora Rodriguez, uh, Don Jose's wife, who is also uh, one of the co-founders. And for many of you who know this restaurant, you know that when you leave this place, you tell yourself, when am I coming back? But we're here to celebrate not only of uh, the great food from this great restaurant, but we're here to celebrate an institution in Boyle Heights and East L.A. Uh, certainly, La Serenata has brought many across the river, across the bridges to uh, toast good food and to celebrate the culture that is all around Boyle Heights. Uh, La Serenata first opened its doors in March of 1985 when Jose and Aurora Rodriguez decided to open a small establishment in the community of Boyle Heights. The original idea was to introduce Jose's or El Maestro Salas, as some have labeled him, unique style of cooking to the Boyle Heights community never imagining that the restaurant would reach the heights that it has. Creating a variety of dishes and over 300 sauces to attract a variety of customers was their goal. And throughout the years, Jose and the Rodriguez family has been able to conjure up an interesting menu, which has helped to develop a long list of faithful regulars who keep coming back for the quality food and excellent service. As the restaurant began to gain notoriety, the Rodriguez family decided to branch out and open two additional restaurants in West Los Angeles and Santa Monica. And I remember quite vividly that the one in Ball Heights, they actually expanded to its neighbor. And I remember we were quite cramped when you first started. And now, with the additional space and the beautiful architecture, you really feel that you're in a beautiful uh, Mexican uh, place. As their business expanded, they continued the tradition of cooking Mexican-style seafood with no compromises on freshness, only using the best ingredients, always cooked with olive oil and absolutely no lard. These are the traditions that have made La Serenata a success and a personal favorite of mine. And we all know that when we go to a local neighborhood, when we go to a community, it is the people that run some of the businesses that participate in the community, that support the community, that make all the difference. I think a lot more people today know about Ball Heights because they cross the river, cross those bridges to get to La Serenata de Garibaldi. And now with the opening of the East Side Gold Line extension pending for November, we're going to see a lot more activity and we're going to see a better means of getting to our favorite restaurant just right over the bridge. And I want to congratulate and thank the owners of the restaurant, not only because of what they've done for the community, but at a time when no one wanted to establish a business on this block. They were the pioneers, the pacemakers, and today with a new gold line, we're going to see a lot more activity on that block. But these were the first who got there, the first to say, this is a great place to celebrate great Mexican dishes. So I would like to, on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, present a resolution to the Rodriguez family for 25 years of service in the Ball Heights community. Congratulations and much success in the future. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Can we have a translator, please? Yeah. Translator, please. Okay. Uh, quiero dar las gracias por este like, honor. I would like to thank everyone for this honor. Y son 25 años de mucho trabajo. 25 years have already passed by with a lot of work. Espero verlos en nuestro restaurante para servirles. And I really wish to see you all there at a restaurant so we can serve you. Y pues muchas gracias. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you know, our anniversary is, a, is an homage to all of our customers who have come to share in our traditional Mexican food, culture, margaritas, and aguas frescas. 
and we'd like to extend an invitation for all of you to join us for celebration for this whole month of October. We'll be extending a 15% discount to all who walk through our door and to our new customers who will, for the first time, will be having a great <coughs> dining experience at La Serenata de Garibaldi. They will not forget. Muchas gracias. And hopefully in the future, we're going to be able to, along with uh, Council Member Wizar, name that little corridor Mariachi District, because that's the, the hub of the mariachi culture of Los Angeles. And we want him to take on that particular challenge, and we will work with him with the businesses and the community to name that the Mariachi District of, of, of Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again to the Rodriguez family. And for those of you who do want to go to the res restaurant and visit it, just go to First and Boyle in Boyle Heights. That's where the Mariachi Plaza is. And we do want to uh, start an effort to rename it the Mariachi District. And if you need mariachi, that is one of the few places anywhere in Los Angeles where you could go by, swing by, and pick up some mariachis and go play at your party, backyard party. I know Mr. Zine has a lot of parties, so you could go play at your party, Mr. Zine. And uh, so just go to First and Boyle, Mariachi Plaza, and ask for La Serenata Garibaldi, the mariachis, or anybody else would be happy to point you in the right direction. Thank you very much, and congratulations again. Thank and you. And if I can uh, add my good wishes as well to the Rodriguez's, I'm a, a, a loyal customer and big fan, and whenever I have folks who come from out of town and they want to know, um, you know, where my grandparents grew up and to go to a great restaurant, we always go there, and it is an amazing, amazing institution. Some of the best food of any type in this city is at La Serenata de Garibaldi. So congratulations, felicidades, and we look thank forward you. to many more years together. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Wiesar, for doing that thank as well. Uh, next, we will recognize from the 3rd Council District, Mr. Dennis Zine. Thank you, Mr. President. We are bidding farewell to one of our dedicated city employees. Barbara Sue Glasson Williams, good morning. Good morning. Retired August 18, 2009, from the City of Los Angeles Community Development Department after 37 years of dedicated service to the people of Los Angeles. 37 years. And here they come. Barbara started as a radio telephone operator, a title we don't even use anymore, That's right. in 1973 for the Public Utilities and Transportation Department. Dispatched city work crews, except for fire and police, via two-way radio, relieved operators who worked the city's Centrex phone system. Now that's gone also. Right. <laughs> From 74 to 80, was the customer service representative for the Department of Water and Power Commercial Division later promoted to Special Collections Unit, where she consistently exceeded goals for collecting unpaid final bills. Junior Achievement Assistant from 1980 to 81, one of approximately 20 to diversify the CAO staff, signed as Junior Analyst to Community Development Department. From 81 to 94, administered the department's Disadvantaged Minority Women Business Enterprise Program at its peak just prior to the 84 Olympics had over 2,500 contractors and awarded over $750 million in contracts, hosted the annual Federal Aviation Administration annual conference, first time ever held west of the Mississippi, set the standard for that conference, one of the founders of the Association of Minority Aviation Contractors was a small business assistance where she helped establish a citywide program now referred to as good faith efforts, organized and moderated citywide business fairs and seminars for the business community. From 85 to the present, was a senior management analyst for Community Development Department where she reviewed and evaluated work of analytical staff responsible for monitoring contract performance on grant funded contracts. Her career has come full circle being she was responsible for managing staff that developed and executed CDD grant-funded contracts. Today, myself, along with the City Council, would like to express our warmest congratulations for 37 years of outstanding dedicated service to the people of Los Angeles and extend best wishes in your retirement, much success in your future endeavors. Signed by the City family, authored by Bernard Parks, the Mayor, and all of the Council, for you, Barbara, for 37 years of dedicated service to the people of Los Angeles. And I see you've got some co-workers with you. And uh, we now turn the microphone over to your co-workers, and then we'll hear from you. Co-workers. 
the flower man. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Barbara for the uh, many, many years of good service to uh, the Community Development Department, and I also like to thank the city family for recognizing her extraordinary uh, endeavors and uh, contribution to this uh, fine city. Thank you very much. Any other speakers? Barbara, it's yours. I would just like to say I've really enjoyed the 37 years that I spent working for the City of Los Angeles on behalf of its residents. It didn't seem like 37 years until somebody started counting them up, and that's when I realized, oh my gosh, as you pointed out, everything I started with is gone. I guess it's time for me to go to. Thank you again. Barbara, the equipment's obsolete, but you're not. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go back to photos, everyone. Straight right in the back. Thank you, Mr. President. Back to you. Thank you very much. And, Mr. Clerk, we please call the roll. Alicon, Cardenas, Hahn, Weezer, Caretz, LaBonge, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosnall, Smith, Weston, Zion, Garcetti. Ten members present and a quorum, Mr. President. Okay. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. All right. Mr. Smith moves and Mr. LaBonge seconds. Without objection, those will be approved. Next order of business. Mandatory resolutions for approval. All right. Mr. Reyes moves. Mr. Caretz uh, seconds. Without objection, those two will be approved. Um, if we can run through the agenda, please. First item on the agenda is an ordinance that's noticed for public hearing, and there are cards on that. Okay, let's call that special for cards in the public on number one. Next items. Items two and three are public convenience and necessity items in Council District 9, notice for public hearing, and there are cards on both of those. Okay. Um, we call those special for the cards from the public on two and three. Next item. Items four and five are items for which public hearings have been held. Okay. Colleagues, anybody wishing to call four or five special? If not, let's go ahead and prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Next, order, next uh, items, please. Items six through ten are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. And there is a request to continue item ten one week to October 16th. Okay. If there's no objection, we'll continue item ten till the 16th. That's one week from today on Friday. Um, there's no action required on number six, so we will note that. And seven, eight, and nine. Um, do we have any cards on those? There's cards on all three of those. Okay. So we'll call the special for cards from the public. And if we go to the next uh, items, please. On the continuation agenda, item 11 is an item for which public hearing has been held, and there is a request to continue that to Tuesday, October 13th. Okay. Is there any objection to continuing that if, till Tuesday? If not, we'll go ahead and do that. If we can please call the roll for the special meeting. Uh, Mr. We'll get, let me just do the special meeting. We'll come right back. Uh, special meeting, if we can call the roll, please. Alicon, Cardenas, Hahn, Weezer, Caretz, LaBonge, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weston, Zion, Garcetti. Ten members present and a quorum is present. Okay. Uh, first order. It is a one-item agenda. It's a closed session item, and there is a request to continue that matter to Tuesday, October yes, 13th. I'd like to move that till Tuesday if there's no objection. Uh, so ordered. If we can adjourn the special and uh, come back to the regular meeting. And Mr. Reyes? Uh, number eight, please, Councilman. Yeah, we have that special as well for cards from the public. And that will uh, then take us to our general public comment. Um, we have the podium and two minutes per speaker. Arnold Sachs is our first speaker. I'd like to come forward. After that is Dr. Clyde Williams. Good morning, City Council. Good morning. Arnold Sachs. Administrative disconnect. I believe last week, Councilman Parks attempted to deflect some criticism that had been leveled at the LADOT regarding its handling of a request for proposal bid process that was fumbled by the department. The LADOT had been accused of circumventing a bid process that had been endorsed by the City Council. Action. Councilman Parks, though, said that wasn't the case. In fact, the LADOT had made two attempts to agendize the item for hearings by the Transportation Committee, the appropriate venue for the discussion. What Councilman Parks neglected in his defense in a transparent manner was that the two submissions that had been made by the LADOT were made to Wendy Gruel's office, as she was at the time chairman of that commission, the Transportation Commission. 
Unfortunately, she was newly elected and sworn into a new position as controller. She had no charge of the Transportation Commission, so she would not respond to agendizing the items. The LADOT failed to submit the proposals to the vice chair. Since so great that even as the council endorses transparency, they're lying. The facts is, the fact, excuse me, the facts are, administrative disconnect occurs more often than you would think. And how the council handles it is by telling these half-truths, which really aren't lies, they're just not the truth. Conversely, if they're not the truth, then they must be lies. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Our next speaker is Dr. Clyde Williams. After that will be Oscar Johnson and then John Walsh. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Clyde Williams, 4115 Barrett Road, El Sereno. 710 is still around. Uh, hopefully by the end of the weekend it will be settled as to Senate Bill 545. Probably won't be vetoed. Therefore, 545 will throw away the last two years of work by Caltrans, by members of the Los Angeles City government, and the communities. It says zone three is the only zone. Not zone one, not zone two, not zone four, not zone five. Resolutions by city council members also say not zone one, not zone two. We in zone three, El Sereno, are kind of upset with the situation. However, uh, the council members have a resolution that may say the south portal shall be south of Valley Boulevard. Totally, that is, it will begin and it will end south of Valley Boulevard. We're willing to negotiate. It could go up to the Union Pacific Railroad tracks. However, we've lost two years just because one bill, which was in some ways sponsored by Alhambra and Caltrans, threw away two years of work. However, the communities have come together and are supporting south of Valley Boulevard. Okay, the problem will be that if you put the portal south of Valley Boulevard and draw a straight line to the north portal, it largely lies outside of the city of Los Angeles. There's one little piece between Huntington and Kendall where the tunnel might go under. However, we don't know. And two years of work has been thrown away by the passage of 545. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you for your continuing activism on that. Oscar Johnson is our next speaker, and then John Walsh. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, Councilman. My name is Oscar Johnson. Uh, I'm a proactive. I speak for the press and I speak for culture change. I've seen in the late history, and I've said I've said have been diverse, but have been diverse to uh, illegal immigration. I think we have a constitution tell us equal but equal but sep equal but separate but equal. We should end police shooting of unarmed people. We should end uh, deputies, uh, sheriff deputies shooting unarmed people. We should take the sheriff deputy cars off the streets of Los Angeles and they motorcycle. That's a waste of government money. Do it. They're not needed in our society. That the African American people have enough errors, errors of failure pointed at us. We don't need any more. We need to have a better community life. We need a uh, job for black men so they can uh, get off the corner and support and marry females and have uh, more babies born with marriage because we have too many babies born outside of wedlock today. If we're better marriage, we can have a better society and we'll have a better school system. We need to protect our senior citizens more. I don't know what happened to our senior citizens in Los Angeles, but it seems like they have disappeared. But anyway, we need to end abusing in our nursing homes where our senior citizens live. And there's a senior citizen building on uh, 11th Avenue in Vernon. About six months ago, an, American, an African American senior citizen jumped out the window and committed suicide. And this kind of behavior should not be accepted. We should end government waste because our people, our leaders, is throwing away too much of government waste without our concept. And we always, always see where the uh, 
police department is getting money from government. Government giving government money. I think the policemen and law enforcement thing is so much something that was created to continue to ride the back, black backs of black people for money. Government giving government money, and that's very corroded, and that should be stopped. And I wonder sometimes who left the black females in charge of the bargain here at Walmart. I like to find some answers sometimes. Thank but you, anyway, sir. President Barack Obama had won Thank Nobel you, Peace, Peace Prize. You. John Walsh is our next speaker. After that is Manuel Aldana and then uh, Michael Carrion. John Walsh, blogging at Hollywood Highlands with an S dot org. We're receiving now 12,000 hits a week. Uh, these gift baskets up here, you passed a uh, amendment to the charter. No gifts from lobbyists. Joe Sorella's a lobbyist. There were other lobbyists up here. Take those damn bad gifts and give them to charity. I can't believe, I cannot believe this. Uh, Hollywood, we like to point out the CRA is it, uh, going to be expanding a project. If you want to know if it's in your neighborhood, if you want to know if it's going to be like New London, if you want to know whether your property will be under the threat of eminent domain to be given over to developers, then you go to hollywoodhighlands.org. They'll tell you there. There's still a tasered stiff, a dead man, killed at North Hollywood Station by sheriffs. We continue to ask, what was his name? Ari Blumkatz, the report at the LA Times says, I'll give it to you. He went and he went to the uh, coroner. The coroner will not give the name out. Oh, we would like to uh, thank the LA Times for their wonderful uh, their wonderful uh, obituary on Nancy Daly Reardon. They left out some very important things. Jean Merle, she left out the contribution of a reporter named Martha Groves, if you know what I wa I'm talking about. If you want to read what really happened and why the marriage of the mayor broke up and why he abandoned his wife when she was dying of cancer, go to hollywoodhighlands.org. And finally, I would like to thank PBS for exposing Otis Chandler as an adulterer. And PBS always exposes uh, uh, things 30 years after it happened. This was on the two-hour uh, uh, show they did the other day. At LA Times, the LA stands for lying adulterer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Uh, Hollywoodhighlands.org. Manuel uh, Aldana is our next speaker. He tenemos transcripción para usted, señor. After that will be Michael Carrion and then Michael Hunt. Muy buenos días, señor presidente. Señores concejales, damas y caballeros, mi nombre es Manuel Aldana. Good morning, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, um, rest of the council members. My name is Manuel Aldana. Antes que nada, es este, vengo a exponer las preocupaciones que conciernen a mi comunidad. First and foremost, I would like to share with you some of the concerns that I feel are taking place in my community. Por varios años he solicitado que la persona encargada, o sea, la concejal de la South Central, este asista a los concilios vecinales de South Central. For a few years already, I've been requesting that the council member of our district attend the neighborhood council meetings, which that neighborhood council is in her district. ¿Por qué razón tengo que ir yo a, a la, al concilio vecinal Candú? Para exponerle a la persona que representa a la concejal, exponerle mis preocupaciones de mi concilio vecinal South Central. Why do I have to go on behalf of my neighbor council to talk to the representative, which is Candu, and let them know about some of the concerns that I feel are of great concern in our community? Son muchas las necesidades de mi comunidad y queremos exponerla, pero yo necesito una persona que me atienda para ella exponerle mis preocupaciones. There's a lot of concerning issues that are going on in, a, in my community and I would like to talk to one of the representatives so that person can give me some time and in order for me to speak to them about the concerns that I have about my community because it's, it has a lot of needs. Le agradecería mucho, señor presidente, que por favor me diga con qué persona puedo yo a, a comunicarme, hablar con ella y exponerle todas las preocupaciones de mi comunidad. I would truly appreciate, Mr. President, if somebody can direct me to the correct representative so that I can meet with that person and expose all of the needs and concerns that I are currently going on and exist in our community. Thank you. Gracias, señor. Trataremos de conectar usted a una representante del uh, 
uh, Distrito 9 para usted. Okay? Muchas okay, gracias. gracias. Michael Carrion is our next speaker. Yes, my name is Michael Carrion. Once again, uh, we have 10 council members here, and we only have five at, the, at their desk today. I guess the rest of them are eating in the back. I wonder what I have to do to get council members' attention. Buy you and your staff breakfast, lunch, dinner? What does the public have to do to get your attention? Because apparently you all got gifts on your desk. You get sweatshirts, you get all this, and you listen to those people who bring you gifts. But you don't listen to people who are up here. Mr. Reyes is not at his desk. I'm going to bring you small pictures today. And when I come back, I'm going to bring you larger pictures. I spoke to some property that Mr. Reyes' office had for over a month. He hasn't cleaned it. He cleaned the weeds on the inside so that Paramount Pictures can come in and do a photo shot there. This is supposed to be a condemned building. Yet the city's allowing Paramount Pictures in there to shoot pictures. What happens when someone gets sued or falls and gets hurt? I guess it's not your money, it's taxpayer money, so you don't care. Once again, if you see in these pictures, Mr. Reyes has allowed Paramount Pictures to come in, take the sidewalks over, block the sidewalks, and in his paper he has a quality of life, while the neighbors don't have a quality of life. He may have it in his community, but not in ours. So again, I ask him, when is the city going to go out and clean the property? They haven't. Paramount Pictures went in and cleaned just enough to park their vehicles there. They didn't clean the outside. The quality of life for the people has not improved. As a matter of fact, it's gotten worse. And Mr. Reyes sits here and tells you how well his office is doing. All they're doing is renting out public Thank property. Thank you, Mr. Carrion. Our next speaker is Michael Hunt. After that will be Yvonne Michelle Autry. Mr. Hunt here. All right, Mr. Hunt passes. Uh, Yvonne Michelle Autry, is she here? All right, is Armando Herman here? Sir, if you'd like to come forward, Mr. Herman. If you'd like to come forward, Mr. Herman. You're our next speaker, sir. Good morning. Can, can we have a quiet quorum today? Yeah, go ahead, please? sir. I can, we can hear you. I'll make sure. I'll, can we I'll take care of that, clock? but go ahead, please. Can we restart the clock, please? Go ahead, please. Street Furniture Revenue Fund provides funds for the transits related projects of sidewalk projects, curbs, sidewalk improvements, beautification projects needed to improve conditions for public transit patrons, and all expenses relating to incidental thereto for each council district. Today, Citizens of Los Angeles, I bring to your attention the eyesores of the Department of Building and Safety that they have allowed in place in your communities, in our communities. We as a council have to work together to beautify and improve not just the density of the problems, but the problems as they exist now as we have heard through public comment. I would respectfully like it to be quiet, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. We're trying to take care of the speakers that we called just before to make sure that they're going to be heard next. So go ahead, please. Without further interruption, Pat Gomez of the Department of DCA has improved of some illegal murals throughout the community, some which fall under the city of Monterey Park, others that fell without a legal permit which we all know that the cost of graffiti vandalism, uh, illegal signage, deters people from wanting to live in a quality of life area and situation as we all acquire to have, right? So why is there so much lobbying going on in City Hall as opposed to hearing the real concerns of the public, the true constituents that care to bring improvement to their community. It's a sad day that I have to come back and bring to the attention of council members. I thought we were working together to beautify Los Angeles. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Herman. And to wrap things up, 
I ask that there be a motion sir. placed on the agenda sir. to bring back this ordinance 180 841 to have Pat Gomez and the, Thank and you, the commissioners to discuss okay. this. Our next speaker is Yvonne Michelle Autry. Thank you, sir. I, I got to try to be as even as possible. I did give you extra time for the discussion that you brought up with me. Okay? So I did not. Yvonne Michelle Autry is our next speaker. We just try to keep that as even as possible to be as fair as possible. And M Michael Hunt will follow. I know you both were out of the room. Um, call you again forward. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much um, for an opportunity to address the council. And I'm trying to get your attention with this very bold statement because of the hidden nature of institutionalized racism. Um, I'm not speaking on classicism today or sexism, but there's still quite a lot of hidden discrimination, yes, in America and in the city, unfortunately. Um, of course, I can reference uh, Mr. Michael Hunt and the fact that after his having gone to the Superior Court and won through the system, the the city attorney still is impeding or is preventing him from obtaining the, the, the judgment in his favor, which is a sizable amount. And I, it's my belief that it is as a result of institutionalized racism. He's not able to sell his product. How can he provide for his family? You know, this could render him homeless and then at the mercy and vulnerability of uh, suffering um, police brutality, justifiable homicide, which is the reality of so many black people and poor people. So again, this is institutionalized. He's disabled. He's not able to, I mean, he's not physically disabled, but because of um, the nature of uh, the, the police uh, warrants, uh, the, against him, the case against him, like I said, he cannot work, he's not able to collect a settlement. So where is the justice in this, um, in, in this situation? Um, again, you can prove me wrong and just release the settlement in his, in his favor, which, like I said, he won um, per federal court order, Honorable Judge Pragerson, I believe. And one other um, uh, instance or example of institutionalized racism in the incrimination process of um, working class people downtown, many times we are incriminated to justify um, the service uh, or giving us or trying to give us illegal unlawful detainers so that they can make room for the gentry who are paying two to three hundred dollars more. I have experienced this institutionalized racism. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a, a, a prostitute. I don't use drugs. And uh, we, I just need to draw attention to this institutionalized racism because it is hidden. And this is why we're exposing it because you have the power to eliminate that practice. The next speaker is Michael Hunt. Thank you. Um, after I left here last week, or this week, in one of the remarks of, for my T-shirt, I called several uh, civil rights attorneys, one Carol Sobel, one Jim Lampley, and one Steve Rohde. And I was wondering what the meaning of the T-shirt, what you, all, you always say, the disruptive effect. Each attorney said that they didn't buy that, that that shirt was protected. If it's protected in court, then it should be protected uh, right here in City Hall. So they was wondering, and they asked me, and I, and I had to turn around and ask them, what is a disruptive effect? It sounds vague to me, and anything that's vague is unconstitutional, as we all know in one of my summary judgments. Uh, but nevertheless, we are filing an injunction as of either 2 o'clock today or 9 o'clock Monday morning against the decorum rules so that all those T-shirts and all those uh, messages will be conveyed just as they are in a true environment. If we didn't have racist uh, city council people, then it would surely be understood. I was told to sit down with the T-shirt on, and I, and, I, and I had to ask the Mr. City Attorney. I said, you never asked me to sit down with it off, so if it's constitutionally protected, or is that just racism, or is it just because I'm black? And the key question is probably because I'm black and probably because the message you guys do not like that message is true of some of you guys and some of you guys it's not. So, you know, like I said, there is another lawsuit pending and it's the same thing. It has the same summary judgment value as vague and unconstitutional. They're still writing uh, stupid tickets down at the boardwalk for the performance, uh, you can't have a microphone over four feet tall if you're six feet tall. So none of it really makes any sense. I'm trying to get it all together. 
Thank you, sir. And uh, just for the record, uh, we might find the certain words abhorrent, and we've continually said that, but it is protected speech. People do need to keep the center aisle uh, clear, and when there is the disruption, not the words are disruptive by themselves, but when there is a disruption, we do have to keep the rules of decorum for that. So that will finish our public comment for today. We'll now go to items that are called special, but Mr. Alicone, I know, wants to uh, make an introduction. Mr. Alicone? Good morning, Mr. President and uh, colleagues. We have some very special guests here that I wanted to point out, and uh, we owe them a, a debt of gratitude. Uh, we are visited today by the LA Conservation Corps. Can you all stand up? <laughs> you can applaud for yourselves. That's all right. <laughs> um, now, you, you're very familiar with the Conservation Corps. Uh, but this, not this group of Conservation Corps members, because these are the Conservation Corps members who were hired as a result of the fires that occurred last year. Uh, there is a, a little known uh, grant that we received from the federal government. It's called the National Emergency Grant uh, for Cleanup and Restoration of Fire Damaged Lands. Uh, we received $766,000. It was passed through the Employment Development Department. And it was specifically to pay people for working to restore the community, not necessarily to work directly on the damage, but to fix other areas around the area that, uh, that needed uh, uh, improvement or, or fixing. So these uh, people have uh, earned up to, uh, they're limited to earning $12,000 per worker. Uh, they can work up to uh, 10,040 hours. And at this time when we're experiencing unemployment rates of, of 13 percent and above in many uh, communities throughout the city of Los Angeles, this program was well-timed, but it also provides a valuable service to our community. So these two crews uh, in particular completed four months of fire recovery work, and today we're going to honor them at a luncheon. Uh, we prepared certificates for uh, all of you on behalf of the city council. Uh, and uh, we're also showing them City Hall and want them to take photos with you in the press room. So if you would join us when they come in. Uh, for On behalf of the victims of the fires, I want to say thank you because they have gone through things that, uh, that uh, in fact, some of you may, may have also experienced the Sayer fire and our victims as well. But uh, your contribution is, is a, a tribute to our spirit to uh, rebuild and move on and, and recover from the disaster we face. In fact, if you drive by uh, the Oak Ridge Mobile Home Park, you'll see 50 new structures or so, and the, com the community is coming back. So thanks again to the Conservation Corps, uh, the Employment Development Department, the federal government, and, oh, uh, uh, our uh, work source center, uh, Proyecto El Barrio. Proyecto del Barrio, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Alicorn. Mr. Labonge. Mr. Labonge. Mr. Alicorn, uh, it's great to see these young people here. Another team of young people from the Conservation Corps equally was involved in the restoration of Griffith Park. It's a great experience. I want to thank you all. Some of you I recognize. And if you get extra five minutes, before you leave, wait a second. Go up to the tower. Go to the top of this building. Look at Tom Bradley's tower up there. See some of the pictures. Learn about the history of our city. But I want to thank you for what you're doing now. And this great experience will lead to greater things in your lives. Congratulations. Thank you for bringing them in, Mr. Alex. Mr. Reyes. Mr. Ed Reyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Conservation Corps, Mr. Hop Hopkins. Conservation Corps, before you, you leave. Hold on, Conservation Corps. I just want to take a moment to publicly thank... Mr. Hopkins, and all of you for all the hard work you do. I know there are many other crews involved, and there are many other young people that are playing a huge role. Colleagues, you should know that in our neighborhoods that don't have the city resources, they fill a significant gap. As you all know, we've been pushing for making our very crowded areas, our areas that are not paid attention to, a much desirable place to live in, and because of Mr. Hopkins, they've been able to move resources with the help of the council to essentially help the river corridors, the riverways. They pick up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bags of debris, plastic bags, all the things that punish our ocean 
and our waterways. They're doing an amazing job of cleaning it up. So our ecosystems can breathe. They look much nicer. Our birds have places to nest. They can essentially have their habitats come back because of the hard work of the Conservation Corps. So thank you for every, everything you do, not only in the river, but for the region, because it has a tremendous ripple effect. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Conservation Corps, do a great job out there for the people of Los Angeles. Thank you all for what you do. Thank you. Mr. Reyes, thank you. Mr. LeBonge, thank you. Mr. Alicon, thank you. And Mr. Clerk, next item, please. Item 1, call special for cards. Okay, on item 1, we'll hear from the public on the cards. There is a motion to continue that. On the uh, public speakers, we have Arnold Sachs, followed by Dr. Williams, followed by John Walsh. On item number 1. And our Conservation Corps guests uh, are getting photos with Mr. Reyes. Sergeant, can we get the uh, Conservation Corps folks maybe go down the center aisle so we can get Mr. Walsh to the microphone and move the meeting along? Mr. Sachs, your time, sir. Well, the aisle's clear, sir. There you go. Arnold Sachs. Thank you. I, I'm kind of um, amazed the DWP taking center stage here again. Um, hopefully, this isn't a process that was um, on the agenda for the new um, what was he? What was Mahai uh, just hired as consultant? This is a, a process for the new consultant to uh, attend to, hopefully, um, because God knows the problems that DWP already has regarding the fees and the way and, and the costs that they just passed through onto the city city um, the people that live in the city of L.A. It's another sham perpetrated by the city council. A hundred thousand dollars, whoop de do, a drop in the bucket. How much is the deficit for the city this year? Four hundred million dollars, and you're talking about a savings of a hundred thousand. Yes, it's good for those people that will receive it, but in the overall effect, it's like a mosquito on an elephant's butt. Dr. Williams, followed by John Walsh. It's a big mosquito. Uh, Dr. Clyde Williams, 4115 Bear Road, El Sereno, DWP. Always blame water conservation for pipe ruptures, for fire, and CD25, and a few others. And now, again, this one, livestock. How many people, when you say livestock, you're actually talking about the registered horses. How many people have registered horses? Not many, and they're generally in a few council districts. Whereas the rest of us have to pay because DWP wants revenue neutral. That is, they get the same amount of money for delivering less water. So that indicates to me that they're also going to have a little bit more profit. Hopefully they could pay for this rather than having the rest of the ratepayers paying for it. DWP, what is it? It's an uncontrolled monster. They don't have a strategic plan. The last strategic plan that would have included water conservation. By the way, we have to reduce urban water con. Uh, consumption by 20 percent within a 10-year period. So why don't we just get rid of this, tell the horse owners, hey, yes, we recognize that you're a good voting block and that you should pay for the water for your horses. All of us with dogs, cats, and chickens, we have to, so why not them? Thank you. Doctor, don't forget the roosters. Don't forget the roosters. 
<laughs> John Walsh, Only one rooster. Uh, it's a big joke, isn't it? Try the comedy store, Mr. Zine. Hollywoodhighlands.org. Blogging. S yes, that's right. This is an exemption here, an exemption there. And he's right. It says registered horse horses and livestock. So we're giving a, ta a break on water li uh, uh, rates to our two-footed friends and our four-footed friends. Now, you were a laughing stock throughout the United States on your, uh, on your chicken amendment recently, your chicken ordinance, and this is more chicken. Now, I can't use the last word. It begins with S-H. But a lot of this is chicken S-H. You can figure out the last word. I'm only taking one minute. And I'll tell you right now, it's city council lays an egg as they exempt the chickens from water ordinance. That's what the Associated Press should lead with. One minute taken out of my five minutes. All I would hide. Uh, Mr. Clerk, we will continue this matter along with the public hearing. And the date on continuation is what? Uh, Wednesday, October 14th. All right. That will be the order. Next item, please. Item two, called special for cards. Number two. John Walsh. Taking one minute. This is the endless liquor license. No one gets turned down by liquor for liquor license. If Al Capone the sixth showed up here with a machine gun and paid the money to the right lobbyist, he'd get a liquor license. Does the Famina Company really need another liquor license? You know what we call Hollywood now? Alka Hollywood. It has more liquor licenses per square mile than any place in the United States. And liquor produces crime. Crime produces more jobs for police. And this is, we are against all, we, liquor license moratorium. Because some people now have to travel 15, 16, sometimes 18 yards to find some place to buy a, a drink. And this is what creates crime. I am waiting for the day you turn down a liquor license. And if that's the day that I die, I will live to be 300 years of age. HollywoodHighlands.org. That matter is now before us. And the Open recommendation the is to grant the application. Very well. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. Next item, please. Item three, call special for cards. Number three, Oscar Johnson. Yes, good morning, Sir Council Oscar Johnson, pro actor, I speak for the president, speak for culture change. As I've seen for this uh, liquor store down on uh, 7 in uh, Figueroa, they are purchasing liquor in a, something like a restaurant. And we have too many easy ways to get liquor in our society. Liquor and drugs is so easy to get than a job, more or less. And we see where the uh, states of the United States of America, they have, they have uh, on this ballot, in uh, November, they're having the uh, lower the drinking age for for teenagers. They have uh, mandate uh, put on a, a ballot that uh, that they can uh, you can be 18 years old to uh, buy alcohol. They're trying to uh, make that a law. The legal the legal age now age nine days to drink alcohol is 21 years old. But if if the politician have their way, the legal age would be 18. And because you see today so many young people cannot handle their situation as it is. And like uh, Mr. Wash said, that look at on would produce more crime, more violence, and produce more jobs for the policemen. And that's something that we should try to exit. We should have asked for a better society, but I see, and I live off of 38th and Crenshaw, 39th and Crenshaw. And right over Crenshaw, we have the Albertson supermarket got drugs, alcohol in it. The Ralph supermarket got drugs in it. We got a liquor store on the liquor bank on Crenshaw and Stocker have drugs in it, have alcohol in it. And uh, across from the uh, liquor bank, there's a smaller uh, convenience store have alcohol and drugs in it. I mean, yeah, have alcohol, and I think drugs will be going on there too in a lot of them places because a lot of times they say, well, you can't fight at Oscar by yourself because they're only selling drugs for the policemen and they got 
power from the policeman to sell the drugs, and they got all protection to sell the drugs. But I say if wrong is wrong, God is who doing it, you know, who doing wrong. But uh, people in the authority should have respect for the people who they, have, who they have authority over. And it's wrong for all these citizens being corrupting with these people in authority, with these uh, government people. Very well. That uh, item's before us. Open the roll. And again, the, uh, the recommendation is to grant the application. Correct. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. Next item, please. Item seven, call special for cards. How about number six? Six, there was no action on that uh, matter today. Okay, there was a card on that item. Number seven. Michael Carrion, number seven. Item number seven. We're talking about rent escrow. Mr. Smith made a comment last week uh, about the property in rent escrows, commercial property that is being rented. The property in question here, Mr. Reyes's district, is commercial property. And it does have the weeds up there. And who is the culprit? The city of Los Angeles. So Mr. Smith should get his facts straight like he tried to tell me. Mr. President, rent I don't believe he's talking about item seven. Rent escrow is what we're talking about, right, city attorney? Rent escrow. Now, rent escrow, don't point the finger at me because I'll point it back at you. You got it? I, okay. I actually... Do it. You, you pointed the finger and I pointed it back. Okay. So now we're talking about rent escrow. Okay? If the property goes to rent escrow, this is city property. It's commercial property. Yet the city is renting it out to Paramount Mattresses, Paramount Studios. They're renting it to Paramount Studios. I'm just quoting what Mr. Smith said. Commercial property rented out can be held in rent escrow. So the rent escrow program doesn't work. It only works for the people of the city of Los Angeles because the city-owned property is rented out. I don't understand this. I guess it goes back to the old notion of hypocrisy, how the city can break the rules and do what they want and rent this property out when the quality of life of the people is being disturbed and they don't go out and clean up their property, but yet they get money, income, from this same property that looks like garbage. If Mr. Reyes wants to copy his pictures, he's more than welcome to come and get them. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney. Just for the record, I was merely pointing to the photographs that the speaker was holding, and I was questioning or inquiring whether those photos were in relation to the properties that were on the agenda. Thank you. That matter is now before us. Open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. Next item, please. Item 8, call special by Councilmember Reyes, and there are cards on that. Mr. Reyes, we have cards on this matter. Would you like to hear from the public? Mr. Reyes, we have cards on this matter. Would you like to hear from the public first? Thank you, Mr. Zine. Would you like to hear from the public or start off? Yes, at the beginning, start off with public comment. Okay. Miguel Luna, followed by Rene Moss. Miriam Torres, Reverend Ricky Hoyt. Uh, Mr. Luna? Sure. Okay. Good morning, Miguel Luna, uh, Executive Director of Urban Semillas. And uh, I'm here to talk about uh, AB 1242 and the resolution introduced by Council Member Reyes. Um, I want to start by indicating that access to clean drinking water might not necessarily register on the mind of Californians as an issue of great concern nowadays. But the truth is that almost a quarter of a million people in California lack access to safe water for drinking, bathing, and cooking. AB 12 1242 changes the language in existing law, which currently describes a citizen's access to clean water as a basic necessity, to one that reads that every human in the state by right have access to this life essential resource for drinking, cooking, and sanitation, and that it be affordable. It also brings together the many agencies in charge of water quality to work together. So I wanted to thank Councilmember Reyes for his leadership 
in sending out a message to the Capitol today saying that LA not only cares about providing safe drinking water to Angelinos, but that we also care about safe drinking water for, every, for everyone in California. So thank you, Council, uh, Councilman Reyes, Council President uh, Garcetti, and also uh, Council Member Tony Cardenas for moving this resolution forward in his committee so that we can get it in time uh, for um, today, since there is pressure on the 700 uh, bills or so that are on the governor's desk. So this couldn't come at a better time. And uh, it really gives us leverage uh, to getting it signed so that we can protect this resource for people today and, of course, for uh, future generations. Thank you. The next speaker, Renee, Moss, and then uh, Miriam, and then uh, Reverend Ricky White. Hello, my name is Renee Moss, and I represent Food and Water Watch. We're a national consumer organization. We're one of the co-sponsors on California Assembly Bill 1242 that declares water a human right. The reason why, one of the reasons why this bill is so important was because there is a growing movement around the world to privatize our water and to deny access to the, deny access of water to people who are some of the poorest people in the world. And so there are growing movements um, to declare water a human right so that as private companies try to privatize our water and sell it to the highest bidder, we can say water is a human right, everyone should have access to it, not just those who are the rich and the elite. So this bill is an important step in being proactive to declare water a human right, and your support on this today is very important, um, sending the message that California is a leader in declaring water a human right, and water should be in the public hands and available for everybody. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Mayor Torres? Hi, my name is Miriam Torres with the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. We're a statewide organization. We're also co-sponsors of the, of the bill. And we're in support of this bill because we work with communities that don't have access to safe drinking water here in California. Um, across, across the nation, the utilities, the water agencies, are failing to provide safe drinking water to all people. The New York Times recently reported that 40% of the nation's community water systems violated the Safe Drinking Water Act at least once. Of those, at least 8.5 million of us in California receive water from those, one of those systems. And as you can imagine, those people, for the most part, will be low-income people of color. In our own neighbor, neighboring city of Maywood in southeast LA County, thousands of people cannot drink their water because it, it is contaminated with chemicals from legacy contamination and also because the water comes out brown. Declaring a human right to water is necessary to ensure that people of color will have access to safe drinking water into the future. It is also setting a precedent for the rest of the nation, for the world, and I think everyone here could agree that we want to be able to provide this precious resource to everyone. Thank you all for your support, and we look forward to um, sending a message to the Capitol. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Hoyt. Good morning. My name is Reverend Ricky Hoyt. I'm the pastor of First Unitarian Church at the corner of uh, 8th Street and Vermont in Councilman Reyes's First District. And I want to thank the councilman for bringing this resolution before the council and for asking for your support for this and giving that uh, message to the uh, state of California. Uh, I'm also here representing the Unitarian Universalist Legislative Ministry, which is my denomination's advocacy arm in, the, in Sacramento, working on statewide legislation. And I'm also here representing the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, which is my denomination's mission arm for international work. Um, our denomination for several years has been working on the issue of water justice. We've been working in our local congregations and also on the state and the na national and international level to bring this important moral issue uh, before uh, our, our congregation members. And we are excited about this opportunity to put California on the map as the first state in the, in the country to recognize a human right to water. 
Uh, we understand that there are many uh, particulars to talk about in terms of water legislation, but I'm here to say that the moral obligation is that water justice be a first principle, that we understand that, the, that a person's access to safe, affordable, uh, sufficient water for their daily use is an important moral principle that should be guiding all of our legislation, should be the first thing on the table, not later on after other issues have been, other speakers have come forward with their uh, other issues. Uh, you can imagine, of course, that, that this, is, this speaks to people's, uh, to our faith um, in the sense of that water is both a, a religious symbol and is also a practical, uh, life-giving uh, uh, requirement for all, all persons. So I'm happy to have to represent uh, the Unitarian Universalist strongly behind this issue. Also, we are building a religious coalition that includes Catholic churches, um, the Lutheran churches, and the Quakers, and this is becoming increasingly a, a recognized moral issue amongst people of faith. I'm happy to put my support behind this and ask for yours. Thank you. Mr. Reyes. Uh, Thank Mr. you, Councilman. Eddie, also Mr. Reyes. Go ahead. Thank you, Councilman. First, I want to thank our guests who have come in here today to share these thoughts with us. The person that I know most, and all of you are active and are strong advocates for your constituents, but Mr. Luna is one person that has traveled throughout the state with a young group of people through our university, and they've seen these systems. They've seen the deterioration, the impact on our ecosystems, and trying to teach them, future leaders, what it means to have this relationship with our waterways, our land, and the way we conduct ourselves as human beings. I think back in 1913, California adopted its first statutory administrative water rights system, which declared domestic use as the highest use of water. This policy reflected a public priority for taking care of human needs ahead of irrigation needs for water as Western states grew and developed with the help of federal irrigation projects. Fast forward almost 100 years, and the very same purpose that that legislation was established back in 1913 seems to be getting lost. When you have human beings today who cannot have access to water on a day-to-day -day basis, where people with limited incomes who are making decisions, do I pay for my rent, do I pay for my food, do I pay for my medication, now they have to ask themselves, do I pay for water so I can drink water today? It has reached a commodity level that's very punitive to those who are the voiceless, for those who do not have representation. When you look at the folks who are actually building the systems, these are the very same people who can't afford to drink the very same water of the systems that they are creating. This is a reality that has to change. And it can start today as the second largest city in this country, as the largest city in this state, as a council office, as council members. We can send a clear message that everyone is important, that the human being has a high priority to live day to day and should have access to water. That is our right, and that is our, I believe, responsibility. I want to thank Council Garcetti for seconding the motion, and I want to thank you, colleagues, if we can have a unanimous vote, this will send a clear message. I want to thank the leadership here for your advocacy because you're bringing to the front, into perspective, a very important issue that everyone should understand. Thank you very much. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. If, if we uh, sometimes call Mr. LeBons Mr. L.A., you're, you're certainly our Mr. Water. And the work that you've done um, along the Los Angeles River and the work that you've done to ensure that we look at water in a holistic way has really transformed our thinking here. I want to thank the coalition of folks that is here as well and all your individual and collective work because I know you're part of a global move now to make water a human right. It is spelled out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we have the right to health. It is one of the most basic rights uh, in the international human rights um, realm. But water uh, has been interpreted as being part of that, but we need to spell it out. And we need to do that at the local level. It was Eleanor Roosevelt who helped write the Universal Declaration of Human Rights who once said, you know, where does human rights uh, happen after all? Is it in distant lands and distant shores? No, it is right here where we are, in our workplaces, on our streets, in our neighborhoods, um, in our city halls. This is where we define uh, what human rights means to us at the individual level and at, at the community level. So I, I thank you for doing that as well. And as we look at that globally, with, you know, six billion people, maybe up to close to seven now, 1.1 billion of them who don't have access to any uh, safe, clean uh, water. We know that, you know, we lose millions of young 
people in the world each year. There are people in our own midst that we lose because of our water contamination as well. Um, we know that over time, and it is one of those reminders that it doesn't just happen in other places where people, um, you know, speak a different language. It happens right here in Los Angeles. Um, and the governor, wouldn't, wouldn't it be ironic that because he's holding out, as you probably said, I'm sorry, I was in the back for a second, holding out uh, all, on signing all bills because he wants a water deal, to have a water bill right here and a water definition um, not be signed because of that. So we hope that even if he's playing hardball with all the rest, that this counts as part of the water package and something that he will certainly add his signature to as well. And just uh, one last thing, you know, Angelinos care about this. I saw a poll from a few years ago that looked at a number of environmental issues, and Angelinos care deeply about all of them, but they asked about open space, they asked about uh, water quality, they asked about uh, air quality, they asked about um, um, the global warming, and there was one other thing. And water quality was at the very highest, even in that list of what Angelinos cared about. And I know that we have, this is, are not just empty words, because when I first came to council, um, I said, why can't we try to look at our stormwater uh, and try to clean up our stormwater um, that was washing out to the ocean and polluting and also going down to our aquifers and polluting our, our water supply. And um, folks said there would never be Angelinos who would vote for that. And we wrote Proposition O, and Mr. Reyes helped us out with that. Ms. Perry was a co-author on that. We put that forward, and it was the second highest vote we've ever gotten on anything in Los Angeles. Only the zoo bond was higher, which means that people do care. They do get it. They're willing to even say, I'll pay a little extra to have clean water. But we have to define that as a right so that people can also take that into courts, take that to other places where they don't have that clean drinking water uh, to ensure that they have the most basic of rights. So thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Reyes, for being such a, a champion on this. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti, Mr. Reyes. That matter is now before us. Open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. Very well. Thank you. Congratulations. Next item. Item nine, call special for cards. Number nine, uh, Mr. Sachs, Dr. Williams, and John Walsh. Special events. Item. Special events. This is special events. Again, while you're on your furlough day, you might want to take a little time to consider that the city is still paying the costs at LA Live, Staples Center the Hollywood Bowl, the Coliseum, and you're not getting paid. Now why, when the city council had its commission to discuss special event fees, they didn't revisit the change in the law that occurred in 1997 regarding the waiver of fees for those arenas, including both the Staples Center and LA Live, which weren't even in existence at that time. So with the city facing its budget deficit, try to figure out how much it costs to provide patrol officers and LA DOT personnel for a minimum of maybe 10,000 vehicles at Staples Center and LA Live, maybe 30,000 or 40,000 vehicles, 30,000 let's say at the Coliseum with each one having two people. Does the city provide um, LADOT and the police at the Disney Center? Does the city provide LADOT and the police for the Amundsen Hall? I mean they're not as large venues but they pay for them. Thank you. Cells. Dr. Williams. Oh. Just a pass through, Doctor. Just a pass through. <laughs> Dr. Clyde Williams, 4115 Barrett Road, El Sereno. I don't mind. I also noticed that two gentlemen have uh, removed their facial hair. Mine's been here for 50 years. Uh, special events. The first one, wow, 
he don't even have an estimate as to how much this is going to cost. Not even an estimate. Dodgers, hey, uh, this is my town. I think it's actually our town. So, and especially if we're going to have to pay for their celebrations. So I would suggest that in the future, all items should have at least an estimate as to what you're going to vote to approve. Uh, this one, if you annualized it, would be about two and a half million dollars. Again, that's approximately half the total budget for the neighborhood councils who are going to have a meeting tomorrow, and maybe this will be a subject of it. Why does the city council have special events rather than just having them being processed through the neighborhood councils? It seems like a reasonable sort, especially since we usually contribute quite a bit of money from our minor budgets, which will probably be less next year, uh, to our own special events within the communities and within the neighborhoods. Highly recommend audits and a, at least an estimate as to how much you're going to approve before you approve it. Oh, by the way, some of these are post facto approvals. So thank you. Mr. John Walsh, and then Mr. Carry on, we got your card, so you'll be next. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Yes, A, the Dodgers, that's a blank check to just fill it in. Some things are reasonable. St. Catherine of Siena Annual Fall Festival, Carnival, $456. Let's not be Scrooge. That makes sense. It's reasonable. Justice Jog? Two, 1826, sorry, I don't know what it is. It's not reasonable. American Dream, $2,000, unreasonable. Uh, the uh, Silver Star Award Ceremony, under $1,000, okay, reasonable. Taste of Encino, $7,479. That taste leaves a bad taste in my mouth, taste of Encino. Spit it out, almost $8,000 to subsidize fancy restaurants. $1,270 for a block party. How many people are going to show up? A couple of hundred. How many people show up at Catherine Siena? Thousands of people. You have to have the test of reason. And incidentally, the, I was just told these free gift baskets have alcohol in them. So get drunk on the free alcohol you got, okay? Get drunk on it. And I just want to say that I made sure that I didn't say anything against the mayor today. It's an open secret in L.A. that the mayor is in poor health. You want to know what's wrong with him? Go to HollywoodHighlands.org. The Times knows it. The Times is covering it up. Your he's, mayor he's is He's not in talking poor about health. this item. Thank you. Constant Mr. Heckling. City Attorney, you have a comment on Mr. Hollywood Walsh's Hollywood. comments? Mr. City Attorney? I already made my comment. All right, Mr. Alicon. I just, I just want to report that... My alcohol is missing. Mr. Alicorn's alcohol basket. is missing. I want, to know, I want to know who took it. Okay, and, thank and, you. And actually... All right. Uh, if Michael, could, carry on. You're up now. Mr. City Attorney? If I could just correct something that Mr. Walsh said earlier. These bis baskets were not from Mr. Sorrell. All right. Mr. Carry on. Your turn, sir. His is in the back. Okay. Special events. Once again, the city's broke. Mr. Reyes and the president up there have towels in front of there. The city can't, the people on TV can't see it. It says, this is my town. Well, you're right. This is their town. Because they don't pay for anything. Every time there's a special event, every time they want to put on a dog and pony show, they let the taxpayers pay for it. Why don't they open the doors to the taxpayers to have them go in there and see a free game? They don't, because this is the Dodgers town. They own this town. And the city council just approves stuff with a blank check. Sure, we'll cover whatever cost there is. We'll do whatever you want. I bet you city council doesn't pay for Dodger tickets. They get in the back door for free. So this is how they approve this kind of stuff. How can you give the Dodgers? This is a for-profit organization. This is not a non-profit. You're giving them a blank check to do what they want. How many times have we had special events here for the Dodgers? Hundreds of times. 
We know what it costs to run these shows. The doctor said it, two and a half million dollars. You know what it's going to cost, but you won't put it on these papers. Why? You don't want the people to know how much more money you're spending on the budget you don't have. I can't understand that. You don't have money, but yet you're spending more and more and more. If I told my child, my son to go out and buy what he wanted, but I don't have money to pay for it, I don't know, he'd probably buy everything. So I guess that's what the Dodgers did. They asked you guys for a blank check, and you gave it to them. All right. Uh, I just wanted, for the record, it's been referred to, this is my town, these towels were passed out at Dodger Stadium by the Dodgers to all the fans. So, And they won the game, the last two games. So anyway, referring to that, that's what the, they were free to the folks who attend the game. Um, that matter is now before us. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. And Mr. Uh, Reyes asked number eight go forthwith. That'll be the order on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Clerk. Council has motions for posting and referral. Post and referred. The desk is clear. Wonderful. Any announcements, colleagues? Mr. Reyes, announcements. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank the Dodgers for bringing thousands and thousands and thousands of fans to Dodger Stadium and spent a good amount of money in Chinatown and Philippe's and all the restaurants around Dodger Stadium, uplifting the spirit of the city. They are in the path of being champions. The bottom of the ninth, Mark Loretta won the game with a base hit. Right when we were down most of the game, the ninth inning with a, a great, great play. Wasn't ninth inning with two outs? Ninth inning with two outs. You can't get closer than that. <laughs> <laughs> and when the gentleman drops the ball between his gloves, it gave us a spark of hope, and we brought it home. So I want to thank the Dodgers for their great enthusiasm, their spirit, their corporate spirit, and more importantly, the path forward to a championship. Thank you very much. Mr. Alarcon, announcements. I, I, I think it has to be pointed out that the, the, the great player who made the air uh, blames it on the rally towels that the Dodgers gave up. So that's truly the fans getting involved in the game that uh, caused him to miss the fly ball that he normally catches uh, blindfolded. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas? Well, now that, now that we're trying to explain why and how the Dodgers won, I was uh, communicating with a, a young boy, Hunter Padilla, yesterday, and he was so excited about what a wonderful game and how exciting it was, and big Dodger fan, and he actually went to the game, and he went to the game at the last minute. So I explained to him, I said, Hunter, do you realize that if, maybe if you didn't end up going to that game, the whole universe would have been slightly <laughs> different, and that guy might have caught that ball. So I think that what made the difference is you were at that game. Very well. Mr. Uh, Garcetti, announcements? No. I really Nothing. Have Any other announcements, Mr. LeBones? No other announcements? For the Italian-American Heritage Month kickoff, Monday is a official holiday. Monday is an official holiday. City Hall, city employees will be off. Mr. Garcetti? And, and just a quick congratulations as well to our president on winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, certainly brings pride to our country and uh, sets the bar for the work that he has to do moving forward. But it was a, a very proud moment for America, at least to endorse the idea that we can engage and we can look towards peace as a way forward. And I know he takes it as, as an agenda for him to uh, enact. Uh, this is only in his first year in office, uh, but we have great expectations of him. And I know that he feels like it is something that many people deserved uh, above him, but we congratulate him and we congratulate him on behalf of the uh, city for making our country proud, too. Thank you. I, a couple announcements. Cabrillo. Tomorrow there will be a Congress of Neighborhoods Conference here at City Hall starting at 7.30 a.m., continuing at 3.30. It will be in the fourth floor media room, at, again, the Congress of Neighborhood Conference. And also there's a number of activities taking place this weekend for our wonderful Los Angeles community. We have no other announcements. Please stand for adjourning motions. Adjourning motions. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, colleagues. I'd like to us to adjourn today in the memory of Woodrow Woody Fleming, who passed away 
uh, early yesterday morning at the young age of 63. Uh, many of us have known Woody for a very, very long time. Uh, he actually worked as a, a labor liaison in my office in, in 2007. He served the city from 1991 until his retirement in 2008. He was born and raised in Los Angeles. He attended Thomas Jefferson High School and L.A. City College. For most of his life, Woody lived and breathed politics and government. Starting as a clerk for the U.S. Postal Service in his early 20s, he went on to be a political director for SEIU and later worked as a senior field deputy for Councilwoman Rita Walters and then as service coordinator for B Bureau of Street Services. Woody was extremely committed to the community. He served as a board member of the Watts Neighborhood Council, a president of California Federation of Young Democrats, a member uh, with uh, me and uh, Dennis on the Charter Reform uh, Commission, and a founding member of the Community United Cannot Be Divided Committee in Watts. Uh, this is just a few of the things uh, that, that Woody was involved in and that he gave his uh, time and talents to. Woody touched so many lives throughout the city and beyond, and everyone who worked with him held him in the highest regard. He survived by his special friend, Rose, his sister, Gladys, his sons, Sean and Kenneth, and three grandchildren. He will be dearly, dearly missed by everyone. Uh, they're asking that in lieu of flowers, donations can be made in his name to the Diabetes Foundation. I uh, served with Woody Fleming along with Janice Hahn in the elected Charter Reform Commission. A wonderful man, always there supporting the people of Los Angeles. He did run for city council. He was a candidate for city council. I remember him during that campaign. Uh, just a wonderful man. He continued working for the city for many, many years. A good friend. Woody was a friend you could count on uh, in good times and bad times. Woody Fleming was always there. A bright smile, wore those cowboy boots and very proud to uh, be a member of the city family. God bless Woody Fleming. Mr. LaBonge. Yeah, just all members, you're right, he was a gentleman, and he truly, this is what uh, someone who grows up in Los Angeles, as uh, Janice mentioned, went to Jefferson, had an opportunity to contribute and be very involved in many, many areas there. It's a sad passing. Uh, Mr. Reyes. I just wanted to, to remember Woody Fleming in, in the context of how he participated in the Northeast area, uh, contributed in, with his uh, professional attitude and was great contribution. So I want to acknowledge his great work in the Northeast. Mr. Herb Wesson. I just want to say I didn't know that he, I just found out Tuesday that he was so seriously ill. But I remember him, uh, we used to call him the wood man. And whenever you had a discussion with Woody, he always had some, some gimmick or scheme or something brewing. And he was a individual that was always trying to do something, uh, something good, something that would benefit other people. So, uh, uh, we're, we're better because, uh, we all knew him, but it is a tremendous loss. All the members on, on that attorney motion. Other attorney motions, colleagues? Uh, Mr. Wesson? Uh, yes. You know, Mr. President and, and members, some people judge uh, one's success in life by the success of their children. So I stand today to adjourn in the memory of Maribel Mamie Blackwell, who is the Bakewell, who is the mother of Danny Bakewell and Pamela uh, Bakewell, individuals that have uh, been on the forefront of human rights and civil rights in the city of Los Angeles, and they're also a very successful uh, business uh, uh, family. Uh, and uh, her, the, Mr. Bakewell, just not too long ago, acquired the Los Angeles Sentinel, which is the largest African American newspaper west of the Mississippi. So I'm sure that Mamie found pride in her children, and if you want to judge her by that, I think that everyone would agree that uh, she was a success. For She lived for 84 years. Uh, 79 of those years she lived in New Orleans, and, and, the only, and she loved New Orleans. The only thing that ran her away was Hurricane uh, Katrina. She, just like uh, my mom and several others, she loved to play cards, bingos, 
bingo and slot machines were one of her, uh, her favorites. And she was also a die-hard uh, New Orleans Saints fan. So uh, I think that uh, she'll be very happy with that team, Mr. LeBonge, the way that they're playing uh, this year. So uh, she survived by, uh, again, Danny Bakewell Sr. and his son, who is the editor of the Sentinel, uh, Danny Bakewell Jr., and Pamela Bakewell, who's a high-ranking member with the Urban League. Mr. Garcetti. All, the, all members. All, all members. Mr. President, I, I'm doing this. This is kind of like you heard of a, a, a joint adjourning. This is a trifecta adjourning. So I'm doing this on behalf of myself, Ms. Perry, and uh, Mr. Parks. And then if we could have all members on it as well. Yes, Mr. Wilson, all members on that. Uh, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask uh, colleagues that we adjourn in memory of Toribio Marin, who was the mother of my staff member and the uh, amazing senior caseworker who runs my Glassell Park office, Sally Martinez. Uh, he was 86 years old, a loving father, grandfather and great-grandfather, and died of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, Sally was very close to him, and uh, Sally was just honored um, with an angel award, uh, which is given every year uh, by a church uh, in the San Fernando Valley for her incredible, incredible work as a um, as a field uh, a member of my field staff, somebody who just, no matter who shows up, she opens her arms up and helps them out with whatever they need, drug addiction, veterans affairs, things having to do with the city or things not having to do with the city. And I know that she has been uh, very torn up. He was sick for a long time, but his passing uh, is indeed sad. And so we, we love her very much, and we ask that, uh, that he rest in peace. Um, he was an earlier uh, farmer in Texas. Um, then migrated here with his family, and he leaves behind seven children, 20 grandchildren, and 15 great-grandchildren. May Toribio uh, Marin rest in peace. No other attorney motions? Uh, Mr. Clerk? Call the roll. The roll's called. We are now adjourned. We will resume next Tuesday. The city is on a holiday on Monday. There will be no meetings. And go Dodgers. Thank you, and have a lovely weekend, everyone, from the L.A. City Council.